So hello, everyone. I am Brooke Warner. I have the privilege of <laughs> thank you of interviewing Mary tonight. And Mary, you all know who she is. So I am going to do a brief introduction, remind you that she has written three memoirs, and that they're all for sale in the back. But you also have memoirs sitting on your laps, which is wonderful. The art of memoir. Uh, Mary is also the author of four books of poetry and a professor of literature at Syracuse University, and she's been teaching memoir for over 30 years, which I said to her means she must have started when she was 15. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the anecdote that I want to share is that last year, uh, I co-teach memoir, and we teach a best-selling memoir course, and we put out to our participants to select the memoir. And Mary was up for the Liars Club against some pretty steep competition, Frank Good McCourt. For Good for me. Yes, J.R. Moringer, who wrote The Tender Bar, and Augustin Burroughs, famous for Running With Scissors. Well, Mary won by a landslide. Yes. And, uh, I never win things. I'm thrilled <laughs> about this. And this was about 400 respondents, so it was significant. And people wrote to us personally to say that they were so moved by Mary's book, by The Liar's Club, and how much it had impacted them, how much it had touched their lives, how brave she was uh, to tell her story. And of course, those of you who have read The Liar's Club knows that she, know that she touches upon difficult subjects, including dysfunctional family, sexual abuse, alcoholic family, system dynamics. And so uh, I do want to read one thing that the New York Times said, the review of your book, <laughs> said, uh, credits Mary with paving the way for a generation's worth of books about dangerously dysfunctional families and keen-eyed kids trying to survive them. Wow. <clears throat> Isn't that right, everybody? <laughs> So we saw that in our feedback, and I want to thank Mary for writing those memoirs, and especially for writing this book, The Art of Memoir, which is a phenomenal examination of the craft of memoir, the genre itself, the process, her personal process, and I'm excited to be having this conversation tonight about memoir. Me too. So thank you. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very uh, psyched to be here. So the first question I have uh, comes from the interview that you gave with Terry Gross a couple weeks ago, or last week. Uh, and Terry basically had asked you about, well, she asked you a lot of questions that- uh, Mostly about David Foster <laughs> mostly Wallace. Mostly about David Foster Wallace. I'm not gonna ask any questions about David Foster Wallace. We can save that for Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is about defending memoir. You, you said to her that you felt that you needed to defend memoir, and I'm very interested to hear why you think memoir needs to be defended. Well, I, you know, when I was in the late 70s, when I was in graduate school, it was the province of weirdos and, you know, <laughs> film stars and Winston Churchill and people like that. And I heard Jeffrey Wolf once describe it as inscribing the Lord's Prayer on a grain of rice. You know, it's just something that nobody really wants to do or be caught doing. And, and um, obviously that has changed. It, the genre has this huge readership. But it's still seen, let's face it, it's a trashy, kind of <laughs> ghetto-ass primitive. Anybody who's lived can write one. Um, <laughs> No, it is. I mean, it's not an exalted form. It's, um, you know, it's sort of the way photography was not viewed as an art uh, for so many, you know, for a century but until it was, and because it wasn't painting. So, so when you say it's ghetto ass, you've described it as outsider art. Yeah, it's like form. hanging a bunch of coke bottles in your pecan tree or something. But I take it, it's a, I take it, it's a compliment. <laughs> What's that? I take it these descriptions of memoir for you are a compliment to the form. I like its democratic uh, aspect. I always liked. Um, I really like that. I feel like there's a drug deal going on in the background, <laughs> <laughs> or some kind of numbers, or like a gambling operation, or. 
or hookers or something back there. But anyway, we're going to do it. It's okay. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was. Just the way that you characterize memoir as low form and these, uh, it's, but it's kind of what I like about it. what you like about it. That's but, the point but I'm it's making. Not, the American Academy is not going to call me, um, however nice you people are, to talk, come here tonight to talk about <laughs> memoir. There aren't any memoirists going to be inducted into the American Academy. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. And one of the things you wanted to do with the art of memoir was to create a book that would rival books that are similar on the topic in fiction, so. Right, um, I, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the great John, John Gardner book or, or the, uh, about fiction or aspects of the novel or, or um, it, you know, any of the great books about poetry that have been written or, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to have a conversation about it. I, I'm, nobody elected me the boss of memoir. Um, <laughs> So I'm not really speaking for anybody for the genre, but I, I you know, it is it is kind of wearying to have the, the that the people who are the big, you know, the people who have lied and been busted, have dominated the airwaves in terms of the practice. You you never see that, you know, you see. I saw James Fry on you know all kinds of tele, national television programs saying, "Oh, this is common practice." To, to this genre, and more recently, uh, you know, Greg Mortensen, the mm -hmm. three cups of uh, horse dookie guy. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about truth, because that's a big topic in the book, and I feel like you got a little bit dinged in the New York Times review, and if I could say what I think happened is... Or Tell me what you think <laughs> happened. I'm dying to know. <laughs> well, it's, there's a nuance that you're getting at, which is around the extrapolation of events or what happened and liars over there. Right. I mean, you know, Greg Mortensen didn't misremember and think he'd been kidnapped by the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> you know, James Fry didn't think he'd gone to jail for a year or whatever and had a suicide, girlfriend suicide. I mean, he didn't misremember that. Those aren't mistaken details. These are people who set out to deceive the public. So my, my point, and, and what I wrote, I actually wrote her about, and I have an op-ed in the, in the LA Times this week, um, was she said that I encourage people to fudge details. And, and um, so I emailed the Times, and I said, I'd like to know on what page of a book that pretty much says all the way through, you know, you really, the truth is hard won, and if you don't stick with what actually happened, you'll never know what it is. Uh, and... And so she, she used as an example that I had said, of course I get all kinds of things wrong. I've I, I probably gotten a million things wrong. I send out pages to, you know, not just to people I write about, but to shrinks and school teachers and, you know, innocent bystanders. <laughs> um, not because I'm, I'm, I made stuff up and I want to be sure that they're going to be ready for it and not make me go on Oprah all sweaty. <laughs> but, but because, um, but because I don't trust my memories. You know, I grew up in this hard drinking household and, you know, I was lied to with conviction, you know, for many mm -hmm. years, you know, starting with the sentence, I'm not drunk. <laughs> Always a lie. Somebody's telling you not, or, or, or everything's okay. You know, the, which was true just often enough to make me truly insane. So, so um, I don't tr I didn't trust my memories. When I sent, send pages out, I always expect people to say, that's not what happened. And it's been shocking to me that people haven't done that. And, and so one of the examples I gave that, that Maslin, so then she emailed me because the Times wouldn't print a retraction. I said, she said, I urge writers to fudge details, and I actually urge the opposite. Yeah. And she said, when I say, you know, I remember kissing this boy, and I remember him chewing juicy for gum, and I remember that he had this seahorse. Uh, we didn't have vertebrates on our, on our shirts, like people who had polo 
horses. You know, we had like seahorse. He had a seahorse on his shirt. And I remember I was probably as revved up as if I had snorted all the cocaine in the world. I had such a crush on this poor, innocent, hapless young, little boy. <laughs> I, you know, and I could just smell, the memory came with this very vivid smell of juicy fruit gum, and I say, maybe I got that wrong, even though he signed off on it. Maybe we both misremember. Maybe it was Double Bubble or Bazooka Joe. <laughs> um, but I don't think the reader, if they discovered it was Double Bubble, would feel betrayed. <laughs> discovered that I had never in fact kissed the boy, that he had never been born, and I lived on an island with Amazons, you know, they would be dis disheartened, you know, that I'd misled them, so. And if seemingly smart people like the reviewer of the New York Times are having a hard time with this nuance, do you think that it's something... I think she just, be, yeah. you know, okay. full disclosure, what I'm guessing, but I don't know this. Yeah. My guess is she didn't fully read the book. Okay. And she's just going with what the common uh, wisdom is, or that she read it in, in this kind of haphazard way, or she said, you know, you're so insulting to James Fry and Greg Mortensen, and I'm like, really? I mean, they weren't insulting. It, it hurt my feelings. I remember them, go, both of them going on TV and, and saying, well, you know, everybody makes this kind of mistake, and yeah. like, no, not that kind of mistake. Yeah. Not that kind of mistake. And, you know, we all wrestle with our memories and we all argue with our families about what did and didn't happen. And our families are insane, let's face it. <laughs> but, you know, to suggest, say, that my mother never wagged a firearm at my stepfather knowledge she wagged a firearm at everybody she was ever married to and most <laughs> most of the people she dated so I mean that was a common that was a common practice for her um, so if I had fabricated that yeah but if such a thing happened how could you forget it Absolutely. And it speaks, to, uh, it's a question I wanted to ask you about the nature of your memory. People have said that you have an amazing memory. You're some, some, somewhat critical of these kinds of details of your memory. And, and yet you also acknowledge that you probably have a better than average memory. And so do you think that traumatic memory is part of that, that it's more acute? It's been suggested to me by doctors, like when I go um, to have my blood drawn for anything. My cortisol level, you know, the anxiety thing, is always like, they'll say, have you just run a marathon? My cortisol level is always super, super high. And, you know, I have symptoms even now of, of some traumatic stress of, you know, I still have night terrors, you know. I, um, but nothing like what I used to, you know, I've been meditating for 25 years and, you know, uh, I do a lot of stuff to try to, make that better for myself. Um, well, we're talking about trauma, but it seems... I, and cortisol, cortisol levels, I think I am a <laughs> super kind of physical person. Like, I think I would have been a massage therapist. Like, I'm a, a carnal person. I don't mean that necessarily in a sexual way, but I'm just somebody who's in my body a lot. And my memory comes with a lot of uh, physical sensation. And uh, it just, it, you guys have had this experience, so I know you have, where you're, um, you know, so I, I go to my high school reunion and they're, it's full of old people. <laughs> Instead of, you know, adolescence, and this girl comes up to me and says, I'm Jana White, and I said, I'm so sorry, you know, I can't place you, and I'm thinking, who are you? And, um, she said, I sat next to you in Miss Pickett's English class. The minute she said that, I could see her 13-year-old face. I could see her hair. I remembered this denim dress she had. She played the clarinet. She had braces. Her dad was a dentist. It's like I remembered that the boy had a crush on sat at the back of the row, and she sat right next to me, and that after that, and Miss Pickett's saying to me, the principal is your pal, as a way of 
of telling me how to spell it. And I remember after, <laughs> after that class that I walked out the door and then I went right to Miss Barnes' speech class and then my locker was just beyond it and I came back. I didn't remember where my locker was. But the, kind of the minute she said that, it's almost like clowns coming out of a car unbidden. I was just flooded with all these sensory memories and I remembered then Miss Barnes was last period and I would walk across the football field where the boy I had a crush on was playing football and that was like you know doing methamphetamine so um, it was so thrilling for me so yeah so I don't but I I keep waiting for somebody to say for some cavalry to write in and say you know but I, like I remember sending the pages to that boy about the Juicy fruit, and he said, um, he said, I, I didn't, I didn't know if the seahorse on his shirt was right, but he said, I can. He said, you're a witch if you remember that. He said, <laughs> he said, the minute you said that, I remembered that shirt, and and it was almost like, you know, touching. I could just feel the embroidery of it on my hand. It was so vivid to me. So. I, you know, who knows how that happens? I, 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 I don't know where my car is. I don't know what city I'm in. I mean, but I remember kissing this boy. The sensory memories. Yeah, it's very, you know. Well, I'd like to ask you, changing the topic a little bit, uh, about, you write in the book a couple different times about the male thought police and another time about the luxury that men must have to not give a rat's ass, your words, about whether people believe them or not. And I was curious about this also because of your chapter on Katherine Harrison, which I would love to ask you why you wrote and included. Uh, but if you think that women need more championing, Women well, memoirs. obviously. Yes. <laughs> I mean, no shit. Yeah. I mean, yes, of course. But I, I, I think it's also true that, um, that that's, you know, we have to take that. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to give it to us, I, I think. Um, I think most of the male memoirists I interviewed said, you know, if they hadn't liked it, I wouldn't have changed a thing. And, and you know, as women, I remember Lucy Greeley, you know, who wrote Autobiography of a Face, you know, saying to me, it's almost unfeminine, uh, you know, to defy your family and to betray your family secrets. It's almost like this terrible thing for a woman to do. And then I think of Nausgaard. Has anybody read that, My Struggle? Yeah, the, the first book is so, first two books really are so great. And then it gets so watered down. But the whole time I'm reading it, all I can think of is, you know, if a woman had written about the minutia of child rearing in this level of detail, she would have been excoriated. Don't you think? I mean, just really, <laughs> and all these intellectuals are, I mean, but the truth is, we're, we don't write about that stuff because, you know, so we've kind of yielded some turf, I think. Yeah, well, and I appreciate your public defense of Lena Dunham's right to write the book. And the question about Katherine Harrison, for those of you who don't know, she wrote a book called The Kiss, and it is about her incestuous relationship with her father. You dedicate a whole chapter to that and basically defend her right and take to task some of the reviewers. Why did you feel that that merited a whole chapter? I mean, for the reason that I have never, I've been doing this, I've been thinking about memoir. When I was 10 years old, I wrote in my little childhood journal, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. <laughs> and then I wrote, after that, I am not very successful as a little girl. <laughs> I know, is that pathetic? Anyway, um, I have never seen anybody cudgeled and sort of belittled. Mm. Katherine Harrison wrote this book about father-daughter incest. She met her father when she was 19 or 20. She was at Stanford. And she had written two novels before. So the reviewer said things like, well, here she's, uh, you know, the motives are, are venal. Her motives are, are uh, you know, she's going to cash in now on this memoir craze. I saw it as a woman artist, as somebody who was trying to not cash in and 
then I met Catherine and I remembered her telling me, um, I felt like I had made the girls in the novels who had these incestuous relationships too young and innocent. And I had lied. And in some ways, by lying, I remained complicit with my abuser. Mm. And, and I was supposed to keep my mouth shut about it forever. And I thought she wrote a wonderful book and an important book. And I've read about, you know, I mean, you know, Michael Ryan published a book about in which he had sex with not just, you know, was, he, you know, borderline rapist. I mean, he tried to rape me at Princeton, you know, when I was a graduate student. And he was a director of my graduate program. And, and I had a sort of physical confrontation with him and wound up spending the night in Pennsylvania Station as a result. He was on the cover of the Times Book Review, you know, writing about these events. And Catherine Harrison, you know, this young woman who is seduced by her father, I don't know, it, it just, people called her a bad mother, they alleged that she had commit, was re-inflicting the incest on her children, and, and, you know, anybody who's ever, you know, had any kind of sexual assault, um, yeah, I remember a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine, a feminist, saying, but why did she have to publish it? And I said, because if she didn't publish it, she was keeping the secret. And I saw it as a brave act of somebody who was trying to purge this subject matter. Um, and it's not that she still hasn't been haunted into writing about insects, but she's written about a whole, whole variety of things. And um, I don't know, I, I just, I, I've never seen anybody dragged through the mud. Yeah. Except for maybe Lena Dunham, and how <laughs> dare she succeed, you know? Well, thank you for including the chapter. I thought it was a, a valuable addition. And you write about self-awareness, the importance of self-awareness. And I think it's so critical for memoir writers. I wonder if you could say more about whether you think that's something you can cultivate. What do you do with a not self-aware memoir student? <laughs> We're all not self-aware memoir students. I mean, all of us deceive ourselves about our, our past. I, there's a joke, and a not very funny joke in my family, the trouble starts, you know, when you hit me back. You know, if you just let me hit you and take it like a woman, <laughs> you know, it would be fine. And so um, I've never written anything um, much in that I didn't wind up changing my mind. And, uh, and I'm somebody who's been in therapy, who's supposedly trying to live an examined life and has been forced by certain traumas to look at my past more than the average person. Um, just to keep from being a nut burger on the subway every day. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think most of us have ways we, like when I'm working with students, you know, the, there'll be some really sweet girl who's writing these really slutty poems, you know, a, a very sort of sweet, innocent girl, and then this girl who's... Um, uh, really traumatized by her romantic travails who doesn't want to write love poems or doesn't want to write about these love relationships because they're too corny and she, so she tries to write in this kind of cool, disaffected, I, I could give a rat's ass voice. And so I think we all on the page believe that we have autonomy, that we can just invent the selves we are and take it to an audience. And um, usually for me it's a writing is a deflating process. Speaking of which, you, people know, you've said that you cut or threw away 1,200 words. 1,200, no, pages. Oh, pages, which is infinitely more words. Way worse. <laughs> Way worse, excuse me, that would be very small, but that's a huge, 1,200 pages. And 1,200 finished pages. They were pages that were like copy edited and gone over and rewritten and clawed over and and had, I'd written over maybe four or five years. And the reason was because they weren't emotionally resonant and they were boring. They were said. boring. So how did you recognize that? And I, I deal with a lot of students who are like, is this boring? And there's concern about the boring 
and you have to figure that out as a writer, and you were an experienced writer, but what made you look at those finished pages and go, wow, these really suck and need to go in the trash? Um, taste. I think having, okay. having cultivated some kind of taste over the years to just know that um, I, I had this idea with lit, and I think, again, it's wanting to represent myself in the world in a certain way. I think about all these crazy guys I dated, and, um, and they just weren't that interesting. It's just my romantic travails were not that crucial to who I was, and the one thing I wasn't going to write about was my seven times married, hard drinking, well armed mother because I had written about her. And of course, I had to make peace with my mother if I was going to become a mother, you know, because uh, it was complicated. And also, if I was going to help her die and be with her when she died and take care of her, um, I, we had to come to some kind of peace. So um, I just didn't want to write it. I just I was like the cat with my claws around the door. And I just had this vague, sick feeling. It's sort of like I have an emotional Geiger counter, and I could just tell that nothing was at stake emotionally for me. Um, often I think the great memoirs are organized around some inner enemy or an aspect of the self that changes over a period of time. And my relationship with my mother um, I adored her, and she might have been a sociopath. You know, she might have been. I don't know uh, what exactly, how exactly you diagnose her. Um, but she was hard to have as a mother, and I adored her. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of my becoming a woman and a grown-up and not, uh, and getting drunk and getting sober and all of that, uh, I had to write about it. And I just, it was, uh, I don't know, it just wasn't attractive. You have said, and you wrote in Art of Memoir, that memoir writing is brutal. I say it's like knocking yourself out with your own fist. <laughs> that it's sort of like I, like I always feel when I'm talking to somebody who's working on one, I always feel like the mean sergeant on platoon, you know, the Tom Berenger guy is going, take the pain, you know, like <laughs> standing over some screaming soldier and just saying, take the pain. Uh, so I you think. think you have to experience that to write a good memoir? I don't know anybody who's ever written one who didn't have something like a nervous breakthrough in the middle of it. Frank Conroy wrote Stop Time, used to, um, used to get drunk about every three weeks, and he'd stay drunk for a month, you know, when he'd finish a chapter. And, uh, you know, Carolyn C. describes uh, finishing Dreaming, that the minute she finished it, um, she had meningitis. When I finished Cherry, I, my editor was in my house in Syracuse, and my son was little, and we turned the last page, and I could feel the fever crawl up my face. Mm. I had a fever of 104 and I had pneumonia, which I'd never had. It just grinds you down in a way. Yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that in my students. I am curious about this motivation of yours to write memoir. I don't think there's very many people in the country who have I, written. Who are this stupid? <laughs> I yeah, know, it's like, it's like winning a shit-eating like shit contest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what am I thinking? Well, multiple memoirs. I know, three of them. All bestsellers. You've said that you've written them for money, but you're also very off the cuff, and so would you have written them anyway? No. <laughs> okay. No, I, I mean, if I hadn't needed the money, no. There were too hard. What kind of person would you be if you hadn't written these books? Um, with less nice shoes. Um, I don't know. My son would have more college debt, you know, where I just wouldn't have been able to pay his way through school. But have you purged something in the writing of your stories? It's obviously been very cathartic. And I think, I also think the books really set my family free in a way, in some, in mm. some crucial way. 
uh, told stories that, um, that everybody in our town knew anyway. It's not like anything I wrote about. The details of it were somewhat mysterious. But uh, the overall, you know, my mother suddenly had children that we, no one had seen before, and they were 40 years old. <laughs> you know, it was like everybody was like, oh, my goodness, where did they, where did you come from? Um, so it's, you know, none of this was a, you know, a vast secret. And I had also, I, when I was first in therapy, and I was just, a, I was depressed. I was, you know, the only time I attempted suicide, I was a child. I was probably, I don't know, nine years old. And um, uh, I sort of, I got into therapy very young, and I cudgeled my mother and sister into talking. And my daddy was kind of nice about it, but, you know, they didn't want to talk about this stuff that I made them talk about. So, but we had sort of had all those conversations before I wrote, 10 years before I wrote the memoirs, so. And you're also, a big champion of memoir writers, and given the current publishing climate, you know that it's very difficult to get published. So if your own orientation to your writing has been that you've done it for money, what do you tell your students or people you're mentoring about their own projects? I say if you don't really have to do this, if you can live a happy life, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I actually have a little test in the art of memoir that you can take. To see, no, I'm serious, to see if you are psychologically ready to climb into your own skull with what's up there. Because I think, uh, I think the people I know who've done it and done it well have been really, have a burning need to figure out what's true. And, and I think I might have eventually written The Liars Club, but I think it would have been a long way, long time coming if I hadn't, needed, hadn't been a single mom without a car in Syracuse. Yes. <laughs> Where the snow is measurable in yards. So, yeah. All right, I think we're going to segue to Q&A at this point. I can tell we have burning questions. Do we burning have? Burning questions, do we have burning questions? I can see people on yes, fire. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> People who think, so you hear what she's saying, that, that, that a memoir can't just be about your life, it has to have a, what do you call it, a hook, or it has to be about some big subject, like, you know, you know, the people with the bad feet or something, you know, like, <laughs> you have to have some topic. Um, I always liked what, what William Faulkner said, that he just wrote about his little postage stamp of reality. And I, I think, I think the most privileged person in this or any room, the person with the nicest skin and the fanciest car and, and the cutest kids, has suffered the torments of the damned, has been heartbroken and devastated by loss, and has disappointed people they loved and done things they're ashamed of. And, and I think every human life has plenty of drama, uh, enough to fill to keep Shakespeare busy forever. So I think you concentrate on your little story and the big story eventually comes out. I think you can't, don't let them bullshit you into packaging yourself so that you don't tell what's really yours to tell. Don't let them scare you off your own suffering by saying it's not important. Because I disagree, I think it's the little small things uh, you know, a lot of my worst days as a child were not my mother shooting at people. It was I would just walk in from school and know that she was sauced and not know what was going to happen. And she would just have this line in her mouth. And that other, you know, what happened to me inside when that was going on, there was no big drama. But it was scary. So, you know, it's trying to recreate that suffering in, in a vivid way that becomes your job, but if you don't honor it, the reader can't. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about, so much has been written about memoir writing, book after book, and it, like yours, it must have interiority, and it must 
must have this and it must have your inner conflict. <clears throat> I would like you to address the line between just letting it all come out intuitively in the voice your writing takes or whether new writers or even seasoned writers are working with all these concepts. You know, it used to be you just write it. I think Anne Lamont talked about shitty first drafts. But now there's a whole lot of information. So can you comment on that? I think, you know, my method is different. I was never really good. Like when people gave me writing prompts in a writing in graduate school, they'd say, you know, write as if you're a bird. And, and I would just be like, I am very sad, the end. You know, like, I just never, it never worked for me when people gave me writing prompts. I could never think of anything. So um, I, can, I can't speak. I think different people have different the nature of their talent is different and their process is going to be different. This is my process and, and from teaching the form I can tell you that um, very few of us have a voice that springs, you know, uh, you know, fully formed as from Zeus's head, you know, that, that it just springs out onto the page. I, I think uh, mostly you write your way into a voice. So I agree with Lamont in that I think you have to generate a whole you know, boatload of pages before you get any traction. My method of doing it would be different. I would do more lapidary work and I would work uh, more worrying the bone of one page you know, for a long time and trying to get the voice right uh, in little small pieces. But that's, that, that might not be the right thing for you. So what do I know? Yes, ma'am. Would you be willing to say a little bit about how your sister fared in all of this? My sister is so rich. <laughs> it was what she wanted, and she got it. And she's done very well. She's done extremely well. She has a great family. Um, uh, she's been married to the same guy now for like 15 years. Um, they don't have any children together, but she has a son. He has four children. Um, and I think she's really happy with the life she's made. She's a Republican, though. <laughs> this is Berkeley, and I can tell you that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sure that I would be just a complete asshole. And you know, I, it's funny. I. Um, I mean, I, I write at the beginning of Lit, he's doing this kind of, he, he had a documentary film class, and, and um, he, was, he read some portion of The Liars Club, which he had never read, and, and he also did these interviews with my mother, found, or found these interviews I had done with my mother talking about our childhood, and, and, uh, or my childhood. It was also my mother's childhood in a strange way, but... Um, <laughs> My mother painted her crazy mother. I wrote about my crazy mother, and he's going to take it on in digital HD. So, um, you know, Godspeed. I've got, you can't sign up to play football and complain you've been hit. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Lu yeah, that's right. Lucy's the, her, the end of that book is very unsatisfying for me as well. I, I agree, and 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 the whole time when she's in in uh, the UK, I think it was Scotland, was it Scotland or um, or or England? I'm sorry, it was Northern England, the Midlands or something. Um, and her family wasn't there, and she was getting all these surgeries, and children were chasing her and throwing rocks at her because she had cancer and didn't have a face. I knew Lucy Greeley as an undergraduate. When I knew her when she didn't have a face at Sarah Lawrence, when she literally had no lower jaw because of her childhood cancer. Um, and I remember saying to her, you should write this. Hmm. The, your, 
before the book was out. You should write, you're making a mistake because the reader is going to say, is going to indict and convict your family for not being there for you. Um, and on the one hand, Lucy was a drug addict, and every time she had surgery, she got a lot of great drugs. And there were a lot of people telling her these surgeries were insane. She really believed she was going to have a normal face, and that was just never going to happen. I mean, she had a, a reconstructed face, but it wasn't, you could tell that something had happened to her. Um, so, um, so I don't know really. I know from talking to Lucy, from her point of view, she would have felt abandoned by her family. Um, I don't know what that story was, but I know she said I could never, I could never indict them, and yet the absence of her writing about it did indict them, I think. Well, you've got a. Yeah, she she um, her life did open up, and the other thing that happened to Lucy at the end of that book was she got laid. She had been a virgin her whole life, and she was real excited and happy about that. <laughs> um, so we, you know, God God bless her, you know. Yes, ma'am. I never knew in the memoirs where I was headed, with the exception of maybe the Liars Club. I knew that it would end with my mother's secret and that resolution. Actually, that's a lie, now that I'm <laughs> thinking of it. The proposal I wrote went all the way through lit. The proposal I wrote for the Liars Club covered all three books. Uh, went up through, or not entirely to the end of all three books, but up until I got sober in Lit. So, but then once I was writing Liars Club, I realized that the book started with this dramatic night with my family, kind of the worst night of my family's history, with my mother trying to kill us in this fire and all this awful stuff. And then with the resolution of why that happened at the end of the book. So it was a complete, that was the arc of that book. But with Cherry, I had no clue. Lit, I had no clue. And again, I, in those books, I found this sort of inner enemy in the course of writing I found. And I think there is resolution. I think life does. We all make meaning of our lives. And, and that's, in a way, what the book is about. It's about how we all, I want to make better readers for people, not just of memoir, but of their own memories. And have... Um, I don't know, just some kind of conversation about how we do and don't remember. But I mean, what is life about if it's not, we take all this crazy crap has happened to you, and, and you, anytime you fall in love or make a friend or join a synagogue or, you know, go on vacation and sit next to an airplane seat with somebody for a long time, you tell your stories. And you have made meaning of those. You, you have made of them a self. And that is the self through which you filter the world, or, or one filters the world. And, and for me, I just felt so crazy when I was little that I just was, I kind of beamed bad news onto the world. I didn't take it in, so. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, mostly it was a lot of discomfort, uh, the publishing process, that when I turn in a book I always feel, I was talking to George Saunders about this who I've taught with for a long time, I always feel deeply ashamed when I turn in a manuscript. I just feel ashamed, I just feel like this book is horrible and it's worthless. And then by the time I have to go on the road, I've sort of accepted what the book is and it's as good as I can make it and I've just let it go. And then I have to go from city to city and talk to people and act interested in it. <laughs> when I've already written it and I'm actually more interested in all of you than I am in the book. Um, and so, and then I go home and I forget I've written it. 
So I don't know if that tells you what, I, if that's the question you're asking. Yeah, there's an inner and outer self, and there are things I would never write about anybody's penis. <laughs> if they were nice enough to show it to me, I try to keep that to myself. Um, it's a small thing. I'm sure my <laughs> I'm sure my current gentleman caller is grateful for that. But um, yeah, there's an inner self and an outer self. There's a public and a private self, and. And obviously, it's an art of, I'm trying to make a work of art. I'm trying to create for a reader an emotional experience that my experience is, if I do it right, I want it to be like I'm an avatar or like you zip yourself into my skin and see this stuff from my point of view, which is not necessarily historically true or objectively true, but is my experience of it. So. Um, if the reader doesn't read it, it's like a, I don't know, it's like cooking Thanksgiving and nobody eats it. You know, it, it's like, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I, I want people to, to have an emotional experience, to share it. I mean, for me, books were always like, almost like communion, you know, they, that we have made by sitting here, by reading some of the same books and talking about some of the same issues that I, I feel less lonely, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, for someone who's had a childhood like yours, there could be uh, a lot of residual anger around that. And I wonder, as you lived with your mom and then became a mom, if uh, you became more compassionate. I think I was always much more compassionate to my mother than I was to myself. Um, uh, I was that kid. So I was, I always had a lot of compassion for my mother. Um, the anger came when I was first in therapy in my 20s. And really by the time I was 28 or 29 years old, there was a day that I just decided it, that if I treated my mother like as if she were a five-year-old, I would never be disappointed. And that just meant that I had to set some strict boundaries with her. I mean, my... My mother would literally ask me for my clothes when I would, didn't have any money. She would say, oh, I want that shirt. I want a shirt. I've always wanted a shirt like that. And I would have to say, no, you know, you can't have it. You know, it's my shirt. And I like it. <laughs> and um, I will buy you another shirt, but you can't have this one. So, I mean, it was almost like having conversations like that. So I wasn't at all angry with her. Um, obviously, there were flashes of great anger, but... The interesting thing to me is more that now as I've gotten older, if I were to rewrite The Liars Club, uh, where everybody talks about how compassionate I am and loving to my family and how absent of anger it would be, I would feel much more compassionate for my young self. And I don't know if that means I'm more selfish or more narcissistic or, uh, um, or if I'm more integrated into my own feelings, so I don't know, but I know that if I were to rewrite it, I'd rewrite it differently. Yes, ma'am. Um, really well, the poetry, nothing teaches you about voice, language, and economy, like writing poetry. There's nothing, uh, nothing. There's no form, it's the greatest form. I mean, Joyce always once said, you know, everybody starts out to be a poet then realizes it's too hard. And, and um, so I think in terms of de cultivating a voice, that doing that lapidary work, that sentence by sentence, moving words around on a page, and in terms of economy, trying to cut out anything that's boring or tedious, and I also think the great confessional poets, you know, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton and Robert Lowell of the middle of the last century, uh, they started writing autobiographically at the same time Richard Wright and, and Nabokov and Mary McCarthy and Thomas Merton did. Sort of the middle of the last century, um, in the zeitgeist, people began to write 
uh, write about themselves. So certainly writing autobiographical poetry for you know, 15, 20 years before I was an overnight <coughs> success uh, didn't, hurt, didn't hurt my, um, my writing practice. Yes, ma'am. The written version and the, you know, people talk about how Facebook and social media calcify or reduce experience. Language has been doing that. You know, we're symbol making animals and, and you guys know this. I, I mean, one of the saddest things that ever happened to me was after the Liars Club was published and I remember my sister calling to recount a story that I told in the Liars Club as though it were her memory almost exactly in the language I had used writing it. And it made me feel so sad. It was like, oh my God, you know, I, I'm the youngest child, I never knew anything, you know, I, this should be a moment of great triumph. But it sort of made me think, this is sad, my memory became the family memory. And it's, and language as you know, I, I mean, I, I talk at one point, there's a, like two pages, it's not a long thing, about how you choose a detail if you're a writer, how you pick one detail over another. And so many of the d details or, or stories I have are all language. They don't have any sensory data attached to them. And I mistrust them because they might have been something I heard that someone else told me. I, I kind of don't believe them in, in a way. So when I'm trolling, you know, for things to put down to prove one thing or another, uh, I, I'm always looking for those sensory memories that aren't calcified, are uh, reduced in a way by language. So, yes ma'am. God bless you. 15 years. I, you know what? Look at how long it took McCourt. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think most of the ways I deceive myself as a writer are that I forget like I said, we re remember through a filter of self that the self we have now. And it always takes me a while of writing and writing and throwing away and throwing away to sort of get back inside. It's almost like I go back inside my younger self. I know that sounds insane. And I'm sure that it's, and I'm sure memory and imagination inform each other in this process. But, but for instance, I, I remember in Lit, writing about my marriage and it made me sick writing about it. You know, I'm divorced and so obviously it was a failure, but um, just something about it, like even when I was writing, I, I almost tried to make myself look worse than I was. Like I wasn't consciously doing that, but it's just everything bad that happened was my fault and that, that wasn't true. And then I sort of tried to write it where it was all, he did all these crummy things and, and I was nicer and then that was wrong. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong and I was, I pray and meditate before I write. And one morning in meditation, I had this, I was, I asked God to tell me the true thing that I'm supposed to write about. And if you don't believe in God, you can ask your sane self, I think, you know. But it's whatever is south of your neck that is not that fear-based, <laughs> ego-based, but is kind of down in here. I had this image of us when we first fell in love and we were floating in inner tubes down this river. And his hand just brushed my leg and it was the most thrilling thing, you know, that had ever happened to me. And you know, buying a Christmas tree together and moving in together, you know, all the things you do. And I realized that I forced myself to remember through the lens of the divorce. And I had denied the love we had for each other. And the minute I, that image came to me, I opened my eyes and I was just, I was, in, I was sobbing. I was like, oh my God, we were so in love. And I realized not to show that to the reader was to deny what was really at stake. 
you know, and, and I had been unwilling as a writer to go there because it was too painful for me. So it's not like I was writing things that were untrue, but the story that I actually needed to tell, I wasn't telling because I wasn't sort of fully in that former self. Do you know what I mean? Is that what you mean? It is. Yeah, I don't know how you, you just claw. Yeah. Well, Godspeed. God bless you. I hope you sell a million copies. Yes, ma'am. I mean, I, I think there are different shifts in point of view. I think you have an adult voice and you have a child voice. And you, when you initially move back and forth between those, I always say it's like you're laying bread, breadcrumbs. You have to fully occupy that child point of view. And then you show this other self how you get there. So you have to make it very, and then later in the book, after you've done that a few times, you can switch back and forth very fast, and the reader goes with you. But when you first start doing, you have to take a lot of time with both those separate states of mind, making it very clear to the reader what's going on. Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, cool. A memoir for middle grade readers. They need them, right? They only have Helen Keller. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, growing up in the divorce disaster. Yeah, it sounds great. Thanks. And <laughs> any tips or ideas about how to market that? Oh, Jesus. You know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, agents read. Publishers don't read. Agents read. There is a book of agents in your library that will say these are agents for middle school readers. And this is, they, they you, or you find a, a book comparable to the book you've written and you look up who that person's agent is. So I, all those people read and they have people who read for them. So my solution for marketing, learn how to write. If you really want to sell books, write better than other people. <laughs> and, and, and in my experience, that means rewriting. So if you rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and revise and just make it less boring, it's a good plan. Throw away your whole book. Just throw away your whole book and start over. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> How does the region where I grew up, it's so funny. I mean, I was just in Texas. They love me. It's so funny. You're from, where are you from? You're not from Orange. You're from my county. You're from Jefferson County. You know what they call it? The Golden Triangle. It is a black sucking swamp hole. <laughs> but, but so you can testify. I just, I just, you can testify. People say to me, aren't people angry with how you represent their town? And I'm like, they know it's ugly. They're not, they're not thinking, why is our real estate so dang cheap? <laughs> they know it's because it's ugly. They know this. They're not stupid, you know. So um, I'm, I'm astonished, you know, by the reception in my hometown. I mean, you know, people who barely spoke to me, you know, you know, might just sort of showed up. So... I'm actually grateful, and I love that place. I mean, I mean, you know, I was just at the Boudin Hut not long ago, <laughs> eating something called Boudin balls, which you don't even <laughs> want to know about. That's where you get your metaphors, your good metaphors, and your speech. My, the voice all comes from that place. It's a, it's a rich idiom. I'm very rich in that place. I think we'll take two more questions. Two more questions with that. Yes, ma'am. So now I'm, and the postcard thing, so 
postcard. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Right, right. You have, to, you have to write it the way you lived it. You have to write it the way you lived it and tell the truth. And I mean, I didn't want to tell the truth in Cherry. I wanted to write some, I don't know, I don't know what, but you know, what was erotic to me when I was 14 years old was not some image of being boffed into guacamole. It was the idea that this boy I had a crush on would skate over to me with one red rose, you know? <laughs> And I would write his name on my notebook and kind of hypnotize myself thinking about this. That's an uncool thing. It's uncool. But it's true. And so I think you just write the true thing. And, and you find a way to make it as alive on the page as it was for you when you lived it. That's the hard part. Last question? Yes, sir. It's, it's, that, it's that thing of an inner enemy, of a, of a conflict where the character changes, is, has a problem at the begin, beginning and the problem is solved at the end. And the only way I know how to tell you to do it is to, you start telling your stories and, and they emerge. It's sort of like a, a magic pellet that you put in water and a little flower grows out of it. You know, it's, it's a form will emerge if you start writing your stories, and you'll just find that some are more emotionally intense and resonant, and it's going to turn out they're all about the same thing. Um, I just want to tell one last story before we stop. I, 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 last night I was at, uh, where book the hell passage. was I? I? I was at Book Passage, this great <laughs> bookstore, and this guy says, you know, there's these women, they write and they have all these feelings and stuff in their memoirs, but I just like don't have that. And how do I get that into my <laughs> memoir when I write? And I say, put your, your cold sports watching guyness into it. Like, be, embrace what you bring to life experience, you know. Don't worry about doing what these other people do. You have, to, you have to find your little Eunice of you, you know, and embrace that, I think. Um, so I think you find it. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you. Perfect.